I'm going to start immediately just to <coughs> get to know where you fit in into this timeline of the business. So your uncle and your father started off business in the 70s, then they separated, they are two separate businesses, and then your father continued building up in the hotel industry. So where did you come in? There are basically four properties, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, an apart hotel in Bujibba, the, the, the ex Salina, the coastline. coastline, and then the Red is in blue, <coughs> and now your flagship in, in Golden Sand. I mean, the, the, the story, if I go back uh, a little bit, uh, my father was a teacher for 15 years, and uh, more or less when I was born, uh, he decided teaching wasn't earning him enough money. Um, he was excited by it, but not excited enough by it, I guess, at the time. And together with his brother, they started up what today is Alpine Holdings. Uh, they started by uh, selling car hire. Um, they started by doing taxi rides themselves, picking up tourists from the airport and taking them to hotels. When they were in the car with tourists, tourists used to ask for you know, where can I hire a car, what can I do? And that ended up with the setting up of Alpine Rent-A-Car at the time, which they set up together. Um, and that grew to a fleet of about 150 cars. And then they started other things, insurance, uh, Malta Tours, which was an agency in the UK that used to sell um, holidays to Malta. So they started incoming tourism. They also opened a woolen leather factory. Uh, Castile Leathers, it was okay, called yes. at the time. And then in 1979 um, was sort of kind of an extension of the tourism industry. The tourism industry was growing in the 70s and they opened together with another family, the Riza Apart Hotel. Okay. That was opened in 1979. It was a small property. Um, effectively, they wanted to build that property in a short period of time. And most contractors that they spoke to at the time wouldn't do it. Eventually, they found a contractor who would build it for them in under a year. Um, that same contractor effectively took the blueprint, the plans, and built another property in the center of Bujibba, which is the one you mentioned, which was the Bujibba Holiday Complex. After a couple of years, um, around 1987, my father decided to retire. Um, he sold... The, the, the business to my uncle, and it, it's a very strong business uh, going up to today, Alpine Holdings, still exists, still going very strong. Um, and my father realized he was, he was allergic to retirement after about ah. two, two days, I think, yeah. or a couple of weeks. And at the same time, the contractor who, who built the original Bujibba Holiday Complex approached him to see if he was interested in, in doing something together. Uh, and that was effectively the birth of Island Hotels Group as it is today. It was a, a partnership where the Bujibba Holiday Complex had 200 rooms to start with. Um, the advice my father gave was that to make any money, that property had to grow in number of rooms. Um, and he decided to put some money into, into that. Um, in fact, the, the birth of the group was the Bujibba Holiday Complex, which then grew between 87 and 89 from 200 rooms to um, about 500, just under 500 rooms, just uh, under 1,000 beds. So that was really the birth of the group. At that time, independently, I had decided to go and study in the UK. I read for a degree in hotel and catering management mm -hmm. um, with an intention of staying abroad. My, my original uh, frame of mind was to study, get a job in the UK or wherever an opportunity took me, and, and go down that route. I love the island. I love the island till, till today, and I, I don't think there are many better places to live, frankly. But my intention at the time was to, to stay abroad. What effectively happened was that uh, the course I did was a sandwich course, so the first two years were at university, the third one was out in industry, and the fourth one was back at university. Uh, the year out I did, I was lucky to be working at the Ritz in London, so a fantastic atmosphere, fantastic property, um, a lot to learn from it, both front of house and back of house. 
Um, and they actually offered me a job for when I finished after my, my fourth year. So when I finished my fourth year, I came back down to Mota to enjoy summer. Um, and I had three months before I went to take up this job. And my father, after you know, two weeks of seeing me coming home, uh, not quite in my senses every, every day and enjoying summer, said, look, said, okay, you've had two weeks of fun, now you need to at least do a bit of work before you go on this adventure abroad. And at the time, at Bujiba, there were some issues within the food and beverage department. So he said, look, have a look at the food and beverage department um, and give me a report on what you think can be done uh, better. Obviously, fresh out of my degree, uh, I wanted to try and impress, so I prepared a nice, colorful report full of charts and God knows what else. And after about uh, 10 days, I took it to him and I, I put it on his table. I said, yeah, you've got the report. He said, okay, great. He didn't even open it. He said, so you know what all the problems? I said, yes. I said, they're all there. I said, you've got lots of problems. You need to. He said, okay. He said, that's the easy bit. He said, now if you have the, uh, the goal, he pushed the report back over. He said, you can solve them. He said, identifying them is the, and I'm still here, <laughs> sort of 20, 22 odd years later. Um, and that was effectively the, the birth of island caterers as it is today, because one of the points identified in that report was the underutilization of the kitchen and FMB resources within uh, the budget holiday complex. And from there, we started doing small events. Uh, we started with a budget for the year. I remember very clearly we had a budget for the first year of 32,000 Malta Liri worth of revenue. In the first year, we did 85. And we've grown every year since in that in You that were area. just 21 in the age, right? I was 21, 21 when I came back. So, um, and probably, if I may say so, probably you are the youngest CEO of such a chain of companies in Malta today. I'm not sure. Uh, I've, I've, I've three, um, very, very young to be managing this. Uh, honestly, I, and I, I've never let age be an issue um, on, on both sides, both for myself and with others. To me, um, age is, is not very relevant. You know, you but if I may ask you, did you ever find an issue with your age here in Malta? Uh, for example, uh, in your relationship with the financial uh, services sector, banks, etc. Or maybe there, the fact that you were your father's son sort of may have helped you a little bit. I, I've, I've never had an issue. Um, I think track record counts for a lot. Um, whether it's family track record, whether it's company track record or personal track record, um, they all count. Whether it's positive or negative, um, thank God we've always had very good support and backing from the banks and the investor community. Um, you saw in the clip, we, we focus a lot on, on, on genuine, genuine people, genuine service, and, and I believe we approach um, business in, in a genuine way. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're, we're necessarily great at, at what we do all of the time. We make mistakes, like, like everyone makes mistakes. Um, but like, like I discussed with my team, if a mistake even a mistake, if a mistake is genuine, people you know, appreciate, appreciate it and, and, and yeah. forgive you and move on. Yeah. If a mistake is done through carelessness or through, through lack of effort, that's a different mm -hmm. kind of mistake, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, if you may, so today your role is a CEO of the company um, and your father is? My father's chairman, is chairman of the company. Okay. In a way, you've clarified the point from so when I was researching your, your history, I, I wondered where you fit in. So actually, you were very much at the very beginning of the growth of the, of the company. Yeah, no, I, I, I joined the company at the, at the early, a very, very early, early stages. Uh, the way we describe it, I, I can describe it in a very simple, simple way. Um, and, and I think both my father and I say the same thing. Um, it's like a horse and, and jockey, I rode on his back for a number of years, then we rode together, and now he rides on mine. <laughs> so okay. if, if that's, a, if that's okay. a, an no, easy way to put it. But, but we've, we've worked very closely yes. uh, together for the best of 20 years. And, and this I'd like to explore with you, because we hear a lot of stories of problems with the second generation um, businessmen, 
where we would have the parent usually who would have founded a business. Um, the business would be treated as being their baby. And then when, when siblings start coming in, when children start coming into the business, obviously, as you say, they want to make their mark. Sometimes they want to prove themselves. And uh, conflict starts instead of really being, um, uh, uh, there's consensus to move the business ahead. It seems that in your case, th there wasn't this issue. It seems like you and your father clicked very easily into the business. So, uh, the, the, the fact that was made clear very, very early was that at home, we don't talk business. Okay. Okay. Um, and at work, we don't talk family. Okay. And I think as long as you separate the two, today I don't consider ourselves a family company. 75% um, of the shareholding is family. But the way we operate is, is very corporate in nature. Um, in fact, I'm the only executive within the company that is part of the family. Um, and I report to three non-executive, non-family shareholders. So that, again, removes the, the business from the family as much as possible. We've had many healthy discussions. We've had many um, issues which we agreed to disagree on. But at the end of the day, whatever decision we took, we both backed. Um, and that helps avoid a lot of problems. So ultimately, we can, we can uh, less now, more in, in, in the past as we were riding together, but to use the same analogy mm -hmm. I used. Uh, we'd have different opinions on things and, and different ways of doing things. But very rarely is the objective different. Okay. So I, I, I find that over the past 22 years, the objective where we wanted to get um, was practically the same most, most of the time. The route with which we wanted to get there would tend to differ. Um, and ultimately, you know, sometimes we, we went his route, sometimes we went uh, my route. But whichever route we took, we then backed fully. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that was, it, it's not, family business isn't easy, and, and if you let it put strain on the family, it will put strain uh, on, on the family. Um, my brother was part of the business as well. He stepped out of the business management side, not equity. The equity is still, um, belongs to him, obviously, before we went public. Uh, and that was a discussion we all held between us, and we said we felt that, going public, we need to, I mean, to use the term, defamilize the, the company. Okay. Um, even internally with management, etc. Management don't want to feel stifled by not being able to advance because there's always a family member who's going to automatically take the job, irrespective of capability. Yeah. Um, which very often happens. This is not Maltese family companies. This is family companies um, worldwide. I'm in a business network called YPO, Young Presidents Organization, where the businesses within YPO account for 10% of the world's wealth generated. A massive organization. It's 15,000 people. Um, within YPO, there are many family businesses, and there are, there are many... Uh, educational sessions on family business, and you find that the issues in family business are common. There's a common thread across the world, uh, which is which is the same, same issues, same problems, same challenges. So this is not something which is specific to Malta. To far me. from it. Yeah. In, in fact, thank you very much because you you actually defined. You said that you moved your business from family to corporate. Now, really, there's no real term. In academia, there's no real term because people sometimes say we moved from family into professional management. And that gives an inclination that before it wasn't professionally managed. Some people say family or non-family. But what does it mean if you still have equity, still a family business? I think the way you spelt it out is a corporate. Um, but can you expand a little bit? What, what does that really mean, the day-to-day -day operations? What does it mean being corporate in it, nature? It, I, it, it's mainly the way you do things and the way you structure the business. Let me give you a, a, a very, very simple example. Very simple. Um, in many family companies, let's take us a hotel. So I might be working on a Saturday, and, and my wife and kids 
might come and eat in the restaurant and I will join them. In many family companies, the family would just walk out afterwards because the business is the families. We don't do that. We sign the chit and the bill arrives the next day or we pay there and then depending on, on, on what the case may be. Um, if, if I have a coffee outside of work, okay, if I'm in my office, I have a meeting and it's business related, I still sign for it and it gets accounted for. Uh, but if it's on my own personal time, then it's paid for. It's not, so it's literally a separation, a clear separation of family from business. And it's not one cash deal. They are very separate cash deals. As soon as you start making the business cash deal, the family cash deal, it becomes a mess. The same for recruitment. If automatically fam family members step in to positions relatively high up the scale, but it could be any position, um, just because they are family, that gives the wrong message to the rest of the team. Um, you know, I had my daughter very disappointed last year because most of her friends applied for summer jobs at one of the hotels and got the job and she wasn't allowed to apply for a job by myself, which is difficult for her to understand. She says, like, sort of that, you know, all my friends apply and are coming to work there. Why can't I come and work? And my reasoning is simple. is because I don't believe she would get the right experience. So I said, look, go out, find a job. You have no help from me. Find a job, negotiate the terms. If you want advice, come to me for advice, but I'm not going to help you do it. And I think that learning process for her was much better than just stepping in to, to a job by some you know, divine right, which I don't believe in. You know, I believe people have to work and earn what, what, okay. what, what they okay. get. So do you ever think of what's going to happen in the future, a succession, who would succeed yes, you, course. your father? So what, how would you tackle that? But succession is a continuous thing. And succession um, can happen through planning and, and when you want it to. And succession can come about without, without warning. So you always need to have uh, a plan there. It, it doesn't need to be you know, super concrete, everything written down, you know, cast in stone. But you need to have an idea of who the next person can be, ideally who the next people can be. In the company, I have at least two, possibly three people that can step into my role relatively easily, relatively quickly. Um, should that worry me? No. That gives me comfort. But I know it would worry a lot of people. So th th there is sometimes a, a feeling of you know, succession becoming a threat. I, I see it as a comfort, not a threat. And for anyone who owns part of the business, it should be a comfort uh, as well. My father and I planned it over a number of, of years. Luckily, it fit, you know, hand in glove, and it fit. Um, I guess we're lucky as well. <laughs> so you haven't anointed your daughter ready to... No, no, no. On the contrary, I've, I've told my children to please not look at the company or the hotels um, and to look elsewhere for a career. If they really believe and they really feel that hotels and, and catering is in their blood and they really want to do it, go and work for another company, locally or internationally. And then if you really feel you want to continue doing it, apply for a job. Okay. <laughs> and see how it goes. Well, most so of our students <laughs> wish that they would be your children. Now, if you've heard it, right? <laughs> you don't have a guaranteed job. <laughs> okay. It's, um, I know it's not no, no, orthodox no, no. and, and, no, no. and yeah. you know, some people think I'm, I'm, no. I'm a bit crazy, but I, I believe that is the right comfort, way. Bill Gates believes the same thing. You know? He mm. says his children just have their education, they go overseas with him, but they do not have an automatic career. So I think you are on the right no. track. Um, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> now, sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm moving a little bit now into the aspect of 
core values, the company's core values. And uh, we do find a lot of acad academic writing saying that initially a company will take up as its main core values, the core values of the owners or of the founders. And uh, I noticed, I, I noticed when I came to visit you at your office, and obviously I would have noticed before, but never went into the office area. I was just a guest, not, not a, your guest. I noticed the photo of Louis Naudi, and I knew Louis Naudi way back. Uh, I know he was a, your own personal friend and the loss to the company and to the loss to all his friends. Uh, but when I noticed that photo, I, I really wanted to ask you, and because I realized the, the ties that you seem to have with your employees. Your employees are not simply employees, but probably most of them at least become nearly family members. Can, can you speak a little bit about this core value that, that you may have as a company towards your, your people? Um, we, we, I, I mentioned corporate. I, I like to describe the, the company as a corporate entity with family values at the core. Um, and effectively, we do regard all the team as an extension of, of the family, the IHG family, as we call it, uh, internally. And ultimately, it's about treating people with respect and, and dignity, not treating them as a, uh, you know, a punch card or a punch clock number or you know, just a waiter or just a chef. No one is just an anything. Everyone is a person, everyone is a human being, everyone has a job to do. Each job is equally important as the next um, because, you know, frankly, if, if a waiter makes a mistake, it's there, it's bang, it's in the customer, it has a negative effect on the company as much as if I make a, a mistake. Um, so it's about treating people like people. Um, okay. No more, no less. If you're walking down the corridor, irrespective of what position you hold in the company, mm -hmm. you know everyone likes to, to, to see you smile at them. Everyone likes to uh, be told good morning or, or good afternoon or asked how his wife or kids are. It, it's normal human behavior. It's, it's, uh, I don't, it, it shouldn't be an effort and it shouldn't be fake. It, it, should, be, it should be genuine. And I think if that happens within the organization, it permeates throughout the organization and people treat each other with respect and, and dignity. But how many people do you employ really? We employ, we take full-timers and full-time equivalents over a thousand. Over a thousand. And I'm, not, I'm sure that you can't remember the names of a thousand people. I try to know as many as physically possible. <laughs> um, I do have to glance at name tags okay. occasionally okay. to remember, but so that's an advantage, yes. <laughs> glancing at a name tag and speaking to somebody using his name is better than not using his name at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think people appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Sometimes they forget my name as well. But that's okay, 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 okay. <laughs> well, you can always <laughs> talk to your father and you're actually <laughs> saying yours. Um, um, this is a quote which your father said. So I'm going to ask you to comment about the quote that he had said. I remember watching him on TV on one of the programs, and, and he had impressed me because he said that whatever problems that a businessman has, an entrepreneur has, um, whenever he's meeting his employees, whenever he's in front of them, he has always a smile. Yeah. Now, that, that in itself, um, uh, in, my, in my view, was a bit of a contradiction in that if you are such a f nice family group, um, why can't you share as well with your employees that a business has its up cycles and its down cycles? Mm, I, I, I don't know which quote it is or which program he was on, but for example, this, this week, on Monday, we had our annual management conference. Every year, we have a conference which is called, we, we call internally the Power of One Conference. Um, and I had 90 people there, and we explained exactly what the, the challenges we are facing are, uh, the opportunities that we have, what's good, what's bad, what we need to continue doing, what we need to do more of, what we need to do less of, everything. So everything is laid out, and, and, and we're quite open and quite straightforward, but that doesn't mean you can't do it with, with you know, dignity and with a smile on, on, on your face. Um, a smile on your face does not mean you cannot be disciplined, you cannot be 
tough where you need to be tough. Um, but being tough and disciplined does not mean you go around you know, with a scorn on your face or frowning all the time either. Your bo body language is, is you know, more than half of the message that you give verbally very often. And, and people feel it. You, know, you, you can be nice to someone and your body language is telling them you don't give a damn. Um, yeah. So okay. it, it's the body language is important. So, so you do agree that even giving sometimes the bad news helps Absolutely. you even motivate people, oh. as you say. It's not just good news that motivates people, but also sometimes knowing exactly the challenges, as you mentioned, that, that the... Yeah, very, very often in a business, people will know, the team will know the problem as much as you know the problem. If you try and, and say there isn't a problem, you lose respect. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I believe you have to tell people what the facts are. And if uh, you, you can't just gloss over it, and you can sugarcoat it to an extent. Uh, the important thing is to explain it properly. So if there's a problem, you need to explain the extent of the problem. You need to explain the depth of the problem, and you need to show that it's not the end of the world either, because uh, the perspective might be different. Um, you know, a, a, a problem in, in some people's mind is, is much bigger than in other people's mind. So it's, it's important when, it, when the bad news is given, it, it's explained properly uh, and it's kept in context. Because if it's not explained properly or it's interpreted out of context, then that could become a problem, a real problem. Do you, um, and I guess you, you do actually, but it's a question that I don't know. You do employ probably non-Maltese employees within the yes. group, right? Yes, the majority of people we have uh, as part of our team are Maltese. Um, over time, yes, there are non-Maltese. Non non uh, since joining the EU, especially because it's become easier to, to work here, uh, we look more than, you know, race or creed or any other qualification. The qualification we look for is genuine, uh, genuine hospitality that can be given to, to our guests. So as long as somebody is, is, is friendly and genuine in his approach, more than the technical side, I'll be honest. I'd, 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 we rather someone join the team who's less technical and more approachable than not approachable and very technical. Okay. And therefore, did you ever have to, in somehow or another, modify or, or amend a little bit your core values because of multiculturalism? Or haven't you met this, this issue yet? No, we haven't met the issue. And I would be very reticent to allowing the culture to change uh, because of something like that. Because I, I don't think you can physically go out and say, I'm going to change the culture. The culture builds up over time through the way people behave, the type of decisions taken, you know, the chemistry of the people coming together. Um, the culture will change going forward if those elements begin to change or if you allow them to change. So if from tomorrow we start adopting a, a higher and fire type of approach rather than what we do today, um, yes, within two, three years' time, I think the culture within the company would be, would be very different. The feeling within the company would be very different. What is your, your modus operandi? No, no, the, the modus operandi today is a human approach, a fair approach. Um, uh, you know, last year we made a, a, a decent operating profit, but a net loss. Um, the easy solution is cut heads. You know, go in and start chopping heads and firing people, reducing the payroll. It's the easy thing to do, to be honest. Um, it's not a fair thing to do. It's not, it's not a human thing to do. And from a business perspective, over the medium and long term, I think it is the wrong thing to do as well. Um, so that is an example of how we do, how we do operate. Um, you know, some people have told me over, over time, you know, we... we we put too much emphasis on people or we treat people uh, too well at the expense of, of profit, maybe. Um, but again, I don't think that is the wrong thing to do. I think we have a responsibility to the people that form part of the team. 
Um, and that responsibility is, is as important as the responsibility we have to ourselves as shareholders and other shareholders as well. And I don't think the two are in conflict. I think over the long term, the two work very well together. And even if you look at you know, major successful companies, if you look at I don't know, Apple, for example, as a model, and the structures that they have in place and the way they, they treat their people, I don't think it's it's any different culturally. Okay, so you do believe it is a, a sustainable model? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have a crew and do like all the television stations. I <laughs> wish that I could ask your employees um, to describe you and some <laughs> of your team to describe you. But but um, if you can, if you can, just imagine what your people would say about you, your your leadership st style. Um, what would you say? Uh, what, what do you, uh, the way that you lead your, your company? You've already given us a lot of insight into how you think. Um, I, I, I think it's really for them to, to answer the, yeah. the question. It, it's, uh, to, to be honest, with my executive team, um, we hold a, a weekly executive team meeting, which is very open, um, and, and we share ideas and we share how, how people are feeling as well. Um, and we've done a number of um, top-down, bottom-up appraisals as well. So I know what at least the executive team they feel. And I think that that feedback is, is, is important mm -hmm. for me as well. Um, we have a low turnover rate, staff turnover rate, um, a very low rate. We've had a number of people who have left the company and who have come back to the company. Okay. So I'm not saying that that reflects on, on me. I, that reflects on the company. The yeah. company is not one individual. The company is a group of you know, over a 1,000 individuals, and everyone plays his part. And, and that is really the company. It's not the buildings. It's not the fixtures and the fittings. It's the people that make up the company. Um, and people like, like that. Um, the effect I have on it, uh, or my father has on it, or senior management has, has on it. Obviously, everyone has his own, you know, leaves his own mark, has his own effect over time. And circumstances also dictate uh, the extent or the, the, the depth of that effect on the company. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, now, most of your properties are under uh, an international brand. You've got Radisson. I believe recently you've acquired Costa, Costa Coffee, right? Um, why, why do you need these international brands in your, in your industry? Brand recognition today is, is yeah, very important for business, in my, in my opinion. Now, you know, Malta is Malta. You can, and we have developed a local brand. Island Caterers is, is, a, is a local brand. Yes. And I think it stands for something and it means mm -hmm. something locally and people expect a certain product level when they see Island Caterers. If I have to take Island Caterers international, it's not going to be recognized. It's not known today. Our clients, most of our clients, most of our guests come from the international market. So when they look at choosing a hotel, like most people when they look at choosing a hotel when they travel, they'd go onto a, a, a website today more than like they would do five years ago, go to a travel agent, and they would see what's available. And a recognizable brand is chosen over an independent hotel, which doesn't necessarily mean anything specific. Um, so with the hotels, when we, when we built the hotel in St. Julian's, we felt we needed an international brand mm -hmm. on the building which people out there can recognize. It definitely has an impact on the business. I think without the brand, we would write less business. We still own and we still operate. Okay. So we operate on the franchise. So the management is still totally in our hands mm -hmm. um, and the ownership is still totally in our hands. Mm -hmm. Um, when we came to Costa, it was the same kind of decision-making process. We bought 50% of a local company 
that had a retail catering arm, um, which was a local brand. And we unplugged the local brand and plugged in Costa, right. after negotiating, obviously, with Costa and winning the rights to the brand. Um, sales have increased over 40%. So same location, yeah. same product, basically coffee and, and, and muffins and sandwiches, but sales 40% higher. Yeah. Um, so that, that possibly explains the, the strength of the brand. Costs are also higher, by the way. When you operate to right. certain brand standards, um, you're obviously paying fees to the, to the mother company of the brand, um, and the cost of operation is also higher because you cannot... Uh, you cannot cut corners, you have to operate to, to spec. Uh, and I've asked you the question to understand, in these relationships that you have with Redison and now Costa, mm -hmm. um, do you feel that your organizations had a lot to learn from these companies? With, with Radisson, when we joined Radisson, they were only 18 hotels back in 1997. Today, they're nearly 400. Okay. Um, when we joined, they were Radisson hotels. Today, they're hotels and resorts. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yes, we learned uh, a lot from Radisson. They also learned from us. So it was a okay. kind of a two-way okay. relationship. And you, you can't go in, in feeling like sort of the, the underdog or, you know, I'm sort of the, 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 yeah. sort of the small guy who, who, who knows nothing. You, you need to stand your, your, your ground as well. And, you, you know, they... they both companies that we joined up with have very similar cultures to ours. So the, the cultures were parallel, and that's why we got on. I think if you join a company or a brand where the, the, the culture is significantly different, it becomes a problem. Mm. With, with Bread, who owned the, the Costa brand, again, we've, we've struck up an excellent relationship. In the last nine months, we've opened three stores. We open our fourth store tomorrow morning, and we have our fifth and sixth, which will open in the next three months. So... Today, they've told us they regard us in the top 10 franchisees worldwide. So we, we've, but that's because we've got on well. We've clicked, we've understood each other. And you can only do that if the culture is the same. This is like a marriage, you know, if, if, if the two people are, you know, too different on a value level, um, then eventually there are, there are problems. But if the core values are the same, you can ride through most, most. Nowadays I wouldn't go there, but anyway. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so apart from yourself and apart from the management team, as, as a thousand employees, um, you feel that you have mastered the, the ability for employees to learn from others and also to be able to pass on knowledge to, to others. In general. Mm. Do, do you feel that the multi-culture sometimes is a little bit, as you mentioned, like always treated themselves either as the little man who know nothing or, you know, how, what, what is your opinion? From, from, from my experience, if you give people the tools and the opportunity to learn, they take it. Okay. Um, you, you get the exception, you know, you've always got the 80-20 80, 80 20 rule mm -hmm. there where some people are, and good luck to them, absolutely happy doing what they're doing and, and they don't really have much interest in moving beyond that. But you have many others who are, you know, fully engaged in their, their process of self-development and, you know, constantly yearn to, to, to learn and, and improve. Um, mastered the ability, I don't think you ever really, you know, there's always room to improve, there's always room to, to, to learn, there's always room to do things uh, better. Um, I don't believe you, you, you can ever, you can strive to reach perfection, but as soon as you get close, you have to push the bar further away and strive even further to reach the next, the next level. So okay. I okay. don't think you can ever do enough. Uh, but if I may, um, first of all, thank you for this book. And <laughs> uh, right. I remember an anecdote from this book. I was glancing it uh, at the very beginning. And like when you have a waitress who takes her own decision to take rose water to, two, to, to a couple who were sick in their room. I mean, that is not, that is not training. It's, it's an instinct, really, don't you think? It's, it's an instinct of a person. Probably it's the upbringing as well of being helpful to others. This, this is where I go back to. We, we try and um, get people to join our team who are, who are genuine in their approach. That makes a big difference, I agree. However, you then have to create the atmosphere where they can do that kind of thing. 
Um, and we do have a training program internally called 100% Guest Satisfaction Guarantee, which enables people to take that kind of decision. Um, ironically, it's also cheaper for the business. Um, because if someone is dealing with a complaint, for example, um, and someone complains to one of the waiting, one of the service team, if they solve it and give compensation, they are likely to give, say, a bottle of wine. If it goes up to the general manager, he'd probably comp the whole meal. So the guest is having his problem solved immediately by the waiter or waitress. The company cost is a bottle of wine. The satisfaction with the customer that it's been solved by the waiter there and then with little aggravation is high and much more appreciated than if it went up the line. If it went up the line to the GM, it's hassle for the client, it takes long, it's more aggravation, you've completely ruined his meal, then you've comped his meal and it's more expensive. Um, today with social media, that becomes even, even more complicated. Yes. Uh, today with social media, um, some people don't even bother to speak to the waiter. They're, yeah. they're there on Twitter or they're there on Facebook at the table yeah. complaining that something isn't as it should be, and it, it you know it gets to uh, social media, and whoever that person is quickly, yeah. connected to before it even gets to us as a, a team. Yeah. So you have to be as quick as physically possible to solve any issues that arise. Any issues arise, you know. No, no company is mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. About your, we heard in in the initial introduction of the company that you are eyeing the possibility of internationalizing. Yeah. That video was put together just before we went public. Um, in fact, I, I referred to we had our eyes on land next to Golden Sands. That land was in fact bought and a couple of weeks ago uh, we finished a two and a half year process to, to get the permits for what, what I believe is going to be a very different development for, for the island, very um, low density, low level. Is it the Halfer? What was before the Halfer? It, it will be yeah. called the Oasis at Golden yeah. Sands okay. Uh, okay. going forward. But it, it, it's a project where the building itself won't show. All you'll see is trees. Okay. Um, so it's very spacious, very airy, um, etc. Um, the other thing I mentioned was internationalization. Y yes, our long-term vision is to take the company abroad. Uh, we have possibilities to do that um, in the near future with Costa. Uh, but the big change since uh, that video has been the economic downturn internationally. Um, today, three years later, the world is a very different place. It hasn't stopped us growing. Um, we've grown the catering side of the company significantly since then. We've bought the land, um, the old Halfer complex, and we've, we've processed the permit. So we've invested um, close to 15 million euros in that project already. Uh, so we're, we're still very positive and very eager to grow. The internationalization will come at a time where we feel is right to go international. Um, the big question that we discuss internally is where? You know, do you go the North African route or do you go the Southern European route? Or do you do both? Uh, and with what? You know, in our business, um, if, you, if you're going to build a hotel of a particular standard, then you're looking at investments of tens of millions of euros. So you need to make sure that that step, when that step is taken abroad, it's taken on very solid footing. Yeah. Because if it's not, you yeah. can, you can you know, bring down the whole pack of cards yeah. at home because of trying to be you know, too, too ambitious. So you need, to, you, need to, you need to get the timing right, you need to get the territory right, and you need to get the investment model right as well. Do you think that Malta is saturated in the hospitality industry? If you take number of beds, the number of beds has been the same for the last 10 years or so. There has been, however, some replenishment. If you, if you take our group, um, the coastline today was the Salina Bay Hotel. The Radisson and Golden Sands was the Golden Sands Hotel. And the Oasis, which we'll build, was the Half Fair. So 
what we did was in three or four of our projects, we took existing bed stock, redeveloped it, and reopened it as new bed stock. So the level of the number of beds doesn't really change, but the quality changes. So I think if you talk about number of hotels, number of beds, um, we have enough for the level of demand that the island creates. Enough in summer. If you take shoulder and winter, we have too much. Okay. Or the way I'd like to put it is that we, don't, we haven't found the formula to create enough demand yeah. in the shoulder and winter seasons. If you ask me, are we saturated on a quality level, I would say far, far from it. I think we, have, uh, we still have a lot of work to do on, on what I call the hard side of the product. And the hard side of the product is you know, the overall infrastructure, the variety of, of things that we offer, people that As visit. An As an island and, and even as hotels. There are, there are hotels that need, that need work, that need lifting up to, to, to reflect the standard that should be mm -hmm. reflected. Um, I think you have areas of the island, tourist zones, which need a serious look and, and rethink. Areas which were fine for you know, the, the late 80s, early 90s, but definitely not ready for 2020. Okay. You know, and we need, we need a rethink, yeah. particularly the, the Bujimba, St. Paul's Bay area. Um, so saturation in number, I would say yes in summer, no in winter. Saturation in quality, absolutely not. I think we have a, a, a long way to go. If you take the soft side of the product, which is the people, I still think that as Maltese, the level of hospitality given is, is generally very good, especially to tourists. Sometimes what I find a bit disappointing is that we treat Maltese guests a little bit differently yeah. to international guests. Okay. So, and you see it. You know, sometimes you see one person going from one table to the other, and he's serving international people, and you say, wow. And then he's going to the Maltese, and it's like, how he should Thank you for kind noticing, of thing, because you notice that quite often, yes. <laughs> it's, it's yes. Which is wrong, which is very wrong, um, and maybe it's cultural. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where the problem lies exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not an easy one to crack, but mm -hmm. there's work to do there. Okay. Um, a little bit, and you will rest a bit your voice as well, but Michael Port in one of his papers specifically talks about the competitiveness of nations. And it's very interesting because tourism and the hospitality industry in general for more that's so very important. Um, uh, and w what is interesting that in his paper he specifies that there has to be intense competition in a particular nation for that nation to be able to be very aggressive and be able to export and move out of that particular nation. If it's too coddly, if it's everything is comfortable, if businesses are doing well, usually there isn't that incentive to move out. And just a couple of days ago, I believe, um, I was reading that Malta has placed in 24, uh, the 24th place in, in a whole scale of tourist destinations, safety, etc. And we've moved up two places. And incidentally, the top 10 are practically European countries, UK, Sweden, etc. Which is, it ties in for what, of what you are saying. But do you see an opportunity for the Maltese ever to move into the top five? Uh, do we have the potential? I mean, culturally, probably we do. Um, uh, but can we move I, further? I, 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 I believe the opportunity is to be number one. And, 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 and I think we have the ingredients to be number one on a number of levels. Is there work to do? Yes, there's a hell of a lot of work to do. But can we get there? Yes. Uh, we have a lot of things which are in our favor. Um, we have the proximity to Europe, flying time. We have the fact that most people speak English, a lot speak Italian, some speak uh, French. We have the safety aspect, which is crucial. You know, we have the weather, which, again, I mean, how many places do, do, today, do you go? Today. I mean, today, <laughs> today is one of those days, but mm. have we had a winter this year? If we have, I haven't really yeah. noticed. I mean, today we had people swimming at the no, pool, sure. at, at the hotel. We people wish we were, were there swimming just We're already that. swimming, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know that's, that's the reality. The you must become very jealous, eh? You're <laughs> working in a hotel, you see everybody swimming, you have to go to work, but anyway. <laughs> I, had, I had someone who, who worked for the company once who joined as a, 
as a way to just as a side mm -hmm. um, anecdote. And after the first uh, day, she came to me. She said, "I can't do this job." I said, "Why? You're tired?" She said, "No." She said, "But." I keep carrying all this beautiful out food out of the kitchen, and I have to give it to people. She said, I want to eat it. <laughs> so she, she, yes, stopped, she stopped yeah. working. She did stop uh, working. She stopped it. She couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't handle it. Um, but I, I, I believe, I genuinely believe that we can be number one. In the past, I've said I think we, you know, have, we have every potential to be Monaco and better. If, if you go to Monaco and you see... Uh, what and uh, Monte Carlo, not Monaco, and you see what, what, what they have and what we have. We can be better if we really wanted to. We can be better, but it has to be a national effort. Yeah. It has to be driven at the highest level. It needs to be believed at the highest level, and it has to be driven at the highest level. I think there's been, you know, even when when and I still am part of MHRA, and, and the message from MHRA has been the same for many years. You know, our industry uh, needs product in place at the highest level, it needs seat capacity, and it needs marketing. So you need, you need the product to attract the people, you need the seats to fly the people in, and you need the marketing effort to tell people that we're actually here to bring them over. It's not rocket science, mm. it, it's, it's relatively simple. When we're talking about product, it's the things I mentioned before, the hard side, which is everything from the rounds to the cleanliness to the hotels, all the infrastructure, to the soft side, which is the people. You know, the training, you know, the, the, the way we treat people, the fact that we don't try and fleece people or take every penny off them while they're here, the safety, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all big, big parts of it. Have, I've seen other surveys, Times UK, that have, have rated Malta as the happiest place in the world, mm -hmm. for example. And those are all good, good PR opportunities for us. But we need to work hard. You know, it's great. We went from 26 to 24th. We went up to that means we did things better. I think in the last five, six years, uh, the stakeholders in the industry have learned to work much more together. You know, Air Malta, MTA, Ministry of Tourism, MHRA, a um, couple of other organizations. And that is the main reason why we had record arrivals three years in a row because people understood and people were working towards the same objective as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the, the proverbial, we're all pushing the car, but you have everyone around the car and everyone pushing in different directions. People were pushing generally in the same direction. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, if we see, for example, the, the, the figures for tourism last year, nationally, we had a record year. Tourist numbers grew by 2.2 percent. Mm -hmm. Guest nights, so the number of nights stayed by by people on the island, grew by 7.8 percent. But hotel occupancies were flat. There was no increase in hotel occupancy, which means that all that growth of visitor numbers stayed in places other than hotels. Okay. So they stayed with friends and family. They stayed in in Apartment. apartments or flats, yeah. um, but not in hotels. Mm -hmm. So while tourism grew, the hotel industry did not grow. Okay. The only thing that grew was unfortunately the cost base through inflation repressions. Yes. So yes. Uh, the reality is that even when one analyzes the numbers in the industry, depending on how you present the numbers, you can give, you can give one impression uh, or, or another. I can sit here and say occupancies remained flat. There was no increase year on year. That would be a correct statement in as far as hotels are concerned. Yes, yes. Would it do justice to the efforts made to keep tourism going, irrespective of the international crisis that there was? No. I think you have to explain it fully. You have to take the different metrics and explain them carefully. Yeah. And in fact, thank you, because I did not ask you the question, but you answered yourself. Because earlier you said that actually the hotel had, I believe, an operating profit, but a net, net loss. As, as, so a, as really a group. So, yeah. and, and I was surprised because we've heard so much propaganda saying that we have so many numbers coming in, such an increase. But yet, you've explained because tourists have more places to stay if they wish to. And, right? and the, the, you know, the international, the international situation is what it is. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen the whole Cyprus situation, mm -hmm. you know, evolve and, and unfold. Uh, that happened 
very fast. Now, yeah. could it be seen coming? Could it not? I mean, one can argue yeah. till the sun goes down. But the fact is it happened very fast. Mm -hmm. And it hit the news very fast. And as soon as it hit the news, it, 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 it went in the direction that it went. Um, you know, there are other countries. You look at, unfortunately, you know, Spain, Greece, Portugal. Uh, the unemployment rates in Spain at the moment are, are a huge concern. Yeah. Huge concern. Thank God, despite all of that happening out there, our tourism numbers continued to increase. So I'm definitely not going to sit here and grumble about the performance. But one has to explain the numbers as, as they are. And this is why I said arrivals grew, guest nights grew, great, and, and especially in the context of what was happening internationally. But the fact is that hotel occupancy has remained flat. If you take five, four, and three all together, room rates increased by three percentage points. But two of those percentage points went to the increase in VAT from five to seven percent. Yeah. Now wages increased, um, water and electricity yeah. costs are what they are. Um, our, our basket of food and beverage products last year increased in price by six point eight percent. So these are these are the realities that that one has to to deal with. Thank you. Um, my last two questions. Uh, first of all, it is the last legislative meeting. We brought somebody from manufacturing, and now we brought somebody from hospitality industry. To be fair, I very rarely, as a lecturer, as an academic, am approached by students whose vision is to join the hospitality, hospitality <laughs> industry. Maybe they feel that it is uh, 24 by 7, you know, there's no family life. Can you speak to the audience and tell them what it, what it is for a graduate to join this, uh, this type of industry? Look, you, it, it, it's true. The, the industry does not, unfortunately, portray the most glamorous uh, of images vis-a-vis -vis employment opportunities. I've had situations in the past where I've received a phone call and said, listen, I'm, it's you know, Joe Bloggs, and uh, I need you to do me a favor. Sure, what's the favor? My son applied for a job with your company as a waiter. I said, okay, I'll look into it. Said, no, 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 please discourage him. Push Marich Nara, waiter. I want, to, I want him to become. I said, with all due respect, you're, you're insulting me. <laughs> you're insulting the company. And you're insulting my whole waiting team. So I, I'm, I, I don't like the way this conversation is going. And no, I'm not going to speak to your son to discourage him. So there is, there is a little bit of an image that sort of you become a waiter to pay off a loan that you've taken to buy your first car. There is that image. Um, the reality is that in, in recent years, I think that's changed a bit. Um, and I think that the biggest, uh, the best way to change it is through role models in the industry. If I give the example, for example, of chefs in the UK. When I was studying in the UK in 87, which by the way, there were 64 people on our course, a hotel and catering degree, only four of us are still in the hotel business. Okay. Okay, so this is it's a bit symptomatic, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's an unfortunate situation in our industry. Um, but to be a chef was looked down upon in 87. Jamie Oliver changed all of that. Okay. Jamie Oliver made it cool and, and trendy to, to, to become a chef. You know, TV chef personalities, etc. they've changed that. Mm -hmm. And that's helped the industry a lot. Um, we haven't had a, 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 someone from the service side, the waiting side, to do that yet. But I think that would help a lot as well. Um, in Italy, people are proud to, to form part of the industry and give a service in a restaurant. There's, there's, there's a lot more pride and passion. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing that pride and passion come in more and more locally over time. And again, especially from the side of, of chefs, but more and more from other areas as well. There's more opportunity for them to um, show off their skills and, and to you know, be creative and innovative in what they do, and they enjoy it. They, they then become more and more passionate about what they do. So I think it is changing. Um, is it a tough industry? Yes, it's a tough industry. Do you work weekends? Yes. Is it sometimes a 24-7 job? Yes. You know, when your friends are out partying on a Saturday evening, uh, you could be waiting tables or behind the reception desk or, or doing something else. You know, Christmas Day, when everyone's having lunch with the, with the family, you could be working. I've worked 
many a Christmas Day, many a New Year's Eve. Um, but there is a, an, an element of satisfaction as well when you're delivering a service and you see everyone enjoying himself and, and having a good time and you're part of creating that. There's a lot of satisfaction as well. We've been at many, many events with, with the team. Um, you know, I remember one in particular where we had two dinners within 48 hours of 4,200 people on the granaries in Floriana. Okay, yeah. So um, you know, many of us literally didn't sleep for, for close to 48 hours, many members of the team. But at the end, when it was all over, everyone was you know, high-fiving and hugging each other because it was a, a fantastic success. Okay. And the fact that you feel part of that success uh, gives a lot of satisfaction. So I think it is an industry where, yes, uh, you work hard, you put in the hours, you make sacrifices. But I think most jobs you make sacrifices anyway. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of satisfaction at the end of it as well. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd Thank like to open to the audience for any questions that you may have to Winston. A couple of questions, if I may. Identify yourself. Uh, my name is John Fjord. Okay. Um, uh, basically, I'm interested in entrepreneurship. Okay, it's, it's one of my current um, interests. And um, I'd like to ask um, Mr. Zara, first of all, um, do you consider yourself primarily a hotelier or, or an entrepreneur? In other words, if you hadn't um, been born into a family which had a business environment, would you still have gone into business on your own, or would you maybe have just taken up a career? As you originally said, you were actually thinking of doing maybe internationally within somebody else's organization. Is it So what I'm trying to say here is, what defines the entrepreneur? What makes you, what are the, the critical factors that make you an entrepreneur? Can you be born an entrepreneur, or can you learn to be an entrepreneur? And uh, what are the things you absolutely have to have to succeed? Um, must you be a risk taker? Must you have access to funding? Um, must you have planning skills? I mean, what, what essentially defines? You have obviously been successful, but what essentially defines that success? Is it long hours of work? What, what are the crucial elements? If, if, if you ask me to describe what I am, I would say an entrepreneur with a passion for hotels and catering. I guess that's the way I would describe it. The ingredients that make up an entrepreneur, I think, are various. And they include luck, which was one of the things uh, that, that you didn't include on your list. Definitely an appetite for risk. Definitely an appetite for an adventure. OK, definitely. Uh, a vision on, on seeing something sort of a couple of years down the line rather than seeing it today. I was speaking to Charles about a particular project um, we're working on at the moment where when you look at it today, you think, you know, what is this all about? But when you see the potential of what it can be two, three, four years down the line, then that vision of seeing it and where it could go, I think is an important ingredient as well. But then you also mentioned access to finance. You need money. Now, the capability of getting that finance and, and then you know, turning that finance into something that is profitable and paying back wherever that finance came from, be it debt or equity or anything else, is also important. The more the ball rolls, the easier it becomes unless complacency creeps in and you end up making a big mistake. Okay, so the, the, the important thing is to keep one's eye on the ball and not let previous successful ventures lead you to taking a decision which brings down everything you would have worked on in, in the past. So an appetite for risk is important, but it has to be a calculated risk as well. You know, unless you have a real you know, mountain of cash that you can afford to lose left, right, and center, then you have to be you know, careful and considered in the type of risk that you take as well. 
Wouldn't but happen. but but luck, like I said, you know, you you can be in the right place at the right time. Um, then it's a case of do you have the guts to take the decision and jump? Uh, and that is where the entrepreneurial side uh, come comes in. But luck plays a part as well. Thank you for that. Uh, and I may just ask a couple of other questions. Have you ever started any enterprise which you realized was not going to be successful and you pulled out of it? Yeah. You have had your share of, of uh, look, failures. And, and, and I can tell you I learned more from those ventures than from ventures that have been successful. Okay, and my last question is, um, should an entrepreneur try to do it by himself or should he trust and uh, uh, choose a partner? Uh, this thing of uh, you know, being let down by others, being stabbed in the back, uh, to what extent is it, is it real in this environment? In our I, 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 I don't think you can be an entrepreneur if you have a high level of paranoia. Okay. So if you're continually looking behind your back because that one's going to do this and that one's going to and that one's going to let me down. The reality is simple. As you work with people, you're going to have people who let you down or you feel they've let you down. Maybe you've let them down and they've walked away to 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 be fair. But you are going to have people that leave the leave the fold. If you focus too much on what can go wrong, then you won't you won't do anything. So my, my intrinsic nature, personally, is, is somebody who sees the, the positive more than the, the, the negative. Um, and that helps me move ahead. If I had to flip that round and I looked at this could go wrong or that, because something's going to go wrong. You just have to have the aptitude and the willingness to fix it and move it to the next stage. And something, some, sometimes something's going to fail completely, and you have to be then clear enough in your mind to be unemotional about it and, and cut, it, cut it loose. It's not easy. It's not easy. But the back. Over. I, mean, I would like to ask a, a question. If the increase in tourists has been introduced to the low-cost airlines, and has this increase in tourists affected the quality of the tourists? meaning that they would look for anything of that rather than staying in a hotel. OK. Um, I, I was one of the people who led the, the, the fight to bring low-cost airlines onto the island. Today, low-cost airlines carry um, pretty much a third of the people that come to the island. If that decision wasn't taken at the time, I firmly believe our tourism industry would be closer to half the size of what it is today. And for a very simple reason. When, when we led that battle, and it was a two and a half year battle, it wasn't an easy battle. I mean, we were referred to as the low cost at all cost brigade at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what we were called. Fine, I have no problem with it. But what many people didn't understand at the time was that People thought we wanted low-cost airlines to come into Malta because they charge less for a flight. The reality is that it had nothing to do with the cost of the flight. The reality is that at that time, and today more so, at that time, 52% of people traveling were choosing to travel by going onto the web, looking at one of the low-cost airlines, websites, seeing what's available in the days ahead or the weeks ahead, and booking one of the destinations that one of those low-cost airlines flew to. Because we didn't have low-cost airlines flying into the island, we were automatically excluded from the choice of 52% of the traveling population. So by not having low-cost flying into the island, we limited our market to 48% of the traveling public, which was crazy. That was one. Secondly, the marketing budget that low-cost airlines throw at filling seats that they put onto a destination that they decide to fly into is much larger than any budget that we can ever have as an island. So we had a marketing opportunity that we were missing out on as well. Third, if you like, was that the price of those flights was also very attractive, so it was easy for people 
to get on, choose, and, and fly. But in that order, it wasn't price that was best. As for the quality, I don't like to refer to quality of, of people, because pe people are people. If, if we refer to it as the sort of propensity to spend of each of the individual, and if I put the question is, is the propensity to spend of someone traveling on one of the low-cost airlines different to someone traveling on legacy airlines, typically no. Um, typically, you would have people who are the same who travel on both sets of airlines. Some prefer one type of low cost or one brand of low cost above another brand of low cost. The reality is they've made destinations much more accessible. They've made Malta more accessible. And I firmly believe today our tourist numbers would be below the 700,000 level per year if we hadn't taken that decision uh, a few years ago. Yes, yes. The, the number of tourists at the time was about 1.1 million. Today it's 1.4. Okay. The, the way, I mean, one, if, if, if I can add, you know, up to five years ago, um, the industry was a very, very different industry. Five years ago, if someone wanted to, to book a holiday, they'd you know, go down to the travel agent, they'd have a chat with the person behind the desk, they'd pick up a brochure, they'd take the brochure home, they might go to the pub, have a chat with their friends, have a chat with family, go back home, have another look at the brochure, go back to the travel agent, say I'm going to go to this place, the travel agent would give an opinion and try and convince them to go somewhere else. Eventually they would book and pay the travel agent uh, a deposit and you know, it, it was a long process. Today all that happens on a sofa at home. You know, on a on a on a an iPad or or, or a you know a, a phone, and on that iPad by by going into you know sites like like Bookings.com and TripAdvisor and Expedia etc., someone researches the destination, reads blogs with comments about that destination, then can zoom in and choose the area of that destination that what they want to stay and read the blogs then the hotel and read the blogs, make up their mind, check availability, check price, compare price, credit card, book, done. In, in one simple process. So the industry is extremely different. We sometimes have people arriving at the hotel before their booking gets to the hotel because they would have booked it at the airport before they left on their iPad. That's how short. Before Literally four or five years ago, um, come 1st of January, I could tell you we're going to have X number of tourists this year and plus or minus 10,000 that be spot on. Today I can't even tell you next month because the lead time, so the amount of time between when people make the booking and arrive in the destination has come down to a much, 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 much shorter time than it was five years ago. There's no comparison. So let's say hotel industry should take into consideration like applications like uh, TripAdvisor and uh, Trivago. Let, let me go this far. The number of stars that hotels have outside their building today are irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. The number of stars that the hotel has on sites like TripAdvisor, and there are a few more, is what really counts. Because that is what the clients, the guests are saying you are. So I can say I'm, I'm, the property is five star. MTA can come and grade the property as five star. The reality is it's irrelevant. It is completely irrelevant. It is what people are saying today. It is what people are saying about you on social media, on blogs, that drives business. If you go into a blog and you see, ah, okay, the service in this place was rubbish, you might not necessarily believe the first one, but if you read 20, and all 20 are saying the service here is rubbish, or the food is rubbish, or uh, the, the property is falling to pieces, you're not going to choose it. Even if it's the cheapest there, you're not going to choose it, because other guests who you trust much more than any message the brand might be giving out, or any adverts might be giving out, that's what drives the decision process today. So today, 
you know, if you tell me, would you put money into social media or into advertising on magazines, it's a no-brainer. It, it's social media. Thanks, thanks for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Brian. What you just said right now is pretty interesting because basically it's this interpretation of the industry. So the middleman is being cut out and people are basically going online and choosing what they like to choose. How has this um, changed your marketing efforts? Because now you have to be more of a marketing organization, not just depending on the NTA probably, but you have to brand your own organization. You mentioned social media. Uh, how you what other actions are you taking in terms of book marketing and also satisfying the customer? Um, to get to get uh, leads with business. Just, just as a as a as an observation, the middleman is still there. Um, it's changed from a tour operator to a web-based company. So, you know, if a booking comes through TripAdvisor or Bookings.com or Expedia, they earn money off bookings that that are made through various websites, I'm mentioning it, but there are various websites. But aren't they more of a passive intermediate in sense? The, in the sense that I want to go to, to the Czech Republic, I just choose the website which takes me there. They, oh. they, they, are, they are passive in, in, in not, not necessarily in the business sense because oh, they're yeah. obviously earning, earning a in little bit of the out of it. In terms of the buying side, it becomes, sorry, it becomes our responsibility fully. Because ultimately, the comments that are out there are a result of what we're delivering by way of product and service. Okay, so if you tell me, are you investing in marketing? Today, the investment in marketing has to be an investment at source. It's not about how, how, how beautiful you make your photos in, in, in magazine adverts or other adverts. It's how effectively you deliver the promise that you're making. Okay, and if you deliver that effectively and you create, today the, the customer satisfaction surveys that we have measure you know, three main areas. If they're scoring you 90% and over, we call them promoters. The net promoter score, right? The net, so you know the net promoter yeah. score. So that's what we work towards. Now, with social media, especially, you need to be creating as many promoters as possible. And that's your marketing being done for you today, more and more. So the effort, you know, one can call it a marketing effort, but the effort is really at source. Deliver, you know, exceed the expectations of the people coming through your door, and they will go on and blog and talk and, and create the marketing uh, reel that you need to bring more business. We're back to word, 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 word of mouth marketing effect. It's just online. Uh, when you say just online, it's uh, shift to a different medium. But a medium which is suddenly gone from the family living room or the pub or a few friends to anyone who's thinking of coming to the destination or the hotel. So it, 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 it's just open, it's out there. One, one question regarding entrepreneurship, just like a different. Um, starting a, a business like a hotel or or a restaurant business requires a certain kind of a certain, requires a certain kind of capital, something which you can get probably from a bank or an equity um, investment. Now, St. Martin's, and of course, there is a new kinds of businesses being created, like technology businesses, um, which require a different kind of capital, which I call risk capital, venture capital. When I was doing my, when I, I just started my own startup, and I didn't even think of looking to more for risk capital. I just went to London and got the uh, VC funding from there. Is there, how is more, or you probably in the circles you move in, probably more aware of this. Um, is, there, is there the capacity to fund multi-s technology startups with the, the kind of, with the right kind of capital? So, I mean, the banks won't fund a startup. But we need angel investors or, or, or you know, people doing portfolio investments, where they know that 20, you know, 19 out of 20 will fail and one will basically turn money. I, I know there have been efforts in, in the past. I'm not aware of uh, any formal structure today that exists for angel investing or venture capital support. Well, it doesn't have uh, to be formal. Support. I mean, it just has to be like networks of people, like angel networks. 
Um, I know there are efforts at the moment to, to put something together. Um, if you ask me, do I believe in it? Yes. Would I like to support it? Yes. Um, I think, let me put it this way, I think for anyone who's been successful in business, it, it's great. One can say, you know, he's been successful, however, however way you want to measure that. Um, and I think there are different ways of measuring <laughs> success. Um, but if, if, if someone feels he's been successful and stops there, I think it's a big mistake. I think you need to then turn that success into something significant. And to me, if you turn that success into something like a program where you can support other people who are starting up in an effective way, then you start sort of creating some kind of significance beyond the success that you've created for the, yourself. The the passive passive or reinvesting back into the, yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I hope that in the next few years we'll, we'll see more of this. You know, we need, because I think one of the problems with suffering is a brain drain where people just go abroad because, you know, that's where the networks are in terms of both financing, legal advice, um, marketing advice. And liquidity. And, <laughs> and the exits, yeah, the all important things. Two questions. Uh, about the national priorities, you mentioned them, and there's to have to be uh, really top, top uh, level uh, push. I, uh, I mean, a few days ago, I was in an Asian country, a poor country, but I was amazed. If you go to a hawker, he doesn't give you the bread with his hands. He puts his hands in a plastic bag because he doesn't have money to buy rubber gloves, and he gives you the, the bread with, with, with the plastic bag. Here, you go to a supermarket, a fine supermarket, but behind the counter, people still handle their things with their hands. So, and the other, the, uh, the other question is about the shoulder period. Some um, hotels, uh, markets, the shoulder period for both people or for both adults. Some comment about that? I mean, about the, the effort being national. Again, this is, this is not the first time I've said something like this. I, I, I think at least nationally, both political parties, I mean, there are more than two, but the main two, um, believe in the tourism industry. I think the realization of the effect of the tourism industry on the whole economy and the speed at, that, at which that could happen has not been realized fast enough, okay? Do we need to do more? Yes. And, and we need to be very careful that we don't take the industry for granted because you know, it, 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 it's very, very volatile as an industry and the switch can be switched off as fast as it can be switched on. You know, we fought and we're talking about low cost airlines. We fought and we brought low cost airlines in. Um, if we get a decision wrong and one or more of those low cost airlines suddenly decide to stop flying, we'll have a major problem on our hands that we need to, need to solve. At the same time, we have our national airline. If something goes wrong with our national airline, equally, we will have a very major problem that we would need to, to sort out. Beyond that, we need to constantly aim to becoming number, number one. And that takes a clear strategic plan that needs to be implemented across the whole industry. So on, on product especially, what are we? What is our brand identity? Today I still uh, don't believe that we have a brand as Malta. What is brand Malta? If you go out to people in the industry and ask them what is brand Malta and what does it represent, you will get a number of different answers from different people. Key stakeholders I'm talking. I'm not talking about uh, you know, one, one of these you know, microphone in the street kind of questions. I'm talking, if you go to the top 20 stakeholders in the industry and ask them what Malta's brand image is and what it represents, you will get different answers because we're not clear about that. So I still think it needs clear strategic direction from, from that level. And then it needs resources being put behind it. Um, and like I said, we need certain attractions which, which 
on a private industry basis don't necessarily make sense because there isn't the, the, the throughput of, of people. And this is why they don't happen. We're seeing the aquarium being built in Bujibba. That is only happening because it has funding support. Because on a, on a, on a normal business model, it, it's very difficult to, to, to make money. But with the support, so it, it, it's a good initiative and it, it's things like that that we need, that we need more of. Um, as for service levels, you know, you know, bread and plastic bags that you mentioned yourself, etc. That is training, and that is that is, you know, a realization that we have to do things professionally and, and, and properly. I think since we joined the EU, it's improved a lot. However, it's come at a cost as well. You know, when when we we held the referendum for the EU, I was president of the MHRA at the time, and we commissioned three extensive reports on the effect the EU would have on the industry. If you reread those reports now. What we said was very clear, and I think it's what has been played out, is that standards have improved, but the cost of delivery of those standards has also come up uh, very, very significantly. Thank you for coming. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, something which I have agreed uh, is that sort of policy which you, have, you and your dad spoke, that family is family and business is business. Uh, you probably probably uh, you have been working for more than 20 years in this business, which started off as a family business. Uh, do you call it home? No. No. Um, like like I said, the team the team is an extended family uh, to me, but it's an extended family that has a job to do, you know, and we have to deliver. Um, on, on a number of different levels. Last Monday, like I said, we had, our, we had our management conference and what we talked about, what I talked about was the, the, the four Ds. I said we need to continue to develop our people, we need to continue to delight our guests, we need to drive the business and we need to deliver results. Um, can you do that with family values at the core? Yes, but is it home? No. Um, Home is home, you know. <laughs> home, you have, you, you have family, and and the set of rules at home, if you want to call them a set of rules, is 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 very different. Um, but that doesn't mean you cannot take the family values from home and have them at the core of the business. But ultimately, it's a business, and you have to tick the boxes of the business as well. Okay. My wife would disagree with me. She said I spent so many hours at the business that that probably was home for many years. <laughs> but that's part of the sacrifice that you make. I'll just make a comment. I won't ask you a question. Um, Charles asked you what you think your employees would say with regards to yourself and your behavior within the firm. And you said you will leave it up to your employees to say that. Well, I had the opportunity of actually interviewing some of your, inter um, your employees because it was part of a, a study I was doing. I was there over the summer, as I was telling you before. And your employees actually described you as um, a very transparent person, a good leader, a strong leader, very fair, and with strong family values at the core. So it's basically the mirror image of what you said, exactly what you would like to put forward is what they see in you. And I congratulate you for that. Thank you. Yes, I've brought uh, a couple of books. Last year was our 25th anniversary and we published uh, a book about the history of the company. The, uh, the book was written by a living author who lived in uh, the hotels for a couple of weeks. And basically, we represented the 25 years by taking 24 hours in the day plus the 25th, which represented the, uh, the future. Um, and you have an extract of what she saw in each of those 24 hours through the eyes of the team members. So we didn't want to... We didn't want to create a book, you know, with pictures about the properties or, you know, the directors of the company or anything like that. We wanted to reflect the story of the company through the eyes of the team members and through the use of a few anecdotes as well that, that could be published because there are many anecdotes which, <laughs> which cannot, which cannot okay. be published.
and I think you will agree to sign them if you if they wish to.